Glastigib is a drug developed by Pfizer for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia. And so I'm going to talk about the 2011 route and then a slightly improved route that came a few years later. And immediately on looking at this molecule, you can divide it into three obvious regions. There's the benzimidazole region on the left, and you could easily imagine making that by the condensation of orthophenylene diamine with the appropriate carboxylic acid. On the right, this aryl substituted urea is derived from the action of an amine with an aryl isocyanate. But the molecule's most interesting feature is this core, because they have to set up a 2,4 trans disubstituted piperidine ring with an antio and diastereoselectivity. The original molecule of interest was this substituted benzene ring, but the piperidine turned out to be the core of choice in terms of optimizing the physicochemical properties. The 2011 route starts with this commercially available Bach protected piperidine building block as the stereochemistry is inverted at this position by converting the OH to a leaving group via mesylation. The mesylate is displaced with sodium azide and then the azide is reduced using palladium carbon and hydrogen. This affords the amine product and this platform is quite nice for diversification to explore the structure activity relationships so various R2 groups can be introduced by reacting the nitrogen with various electrophiles the bot group can be removed and then R1 can be added via reductive amination of the piperidine nitrogen and saponification of the ester affords the carboxylic acid which can be condensed with orthophenylene diamine to afford the benzimidazole fragment I don't think we should be satisfied that this is commercially available though because clearly it takes some interest in chemistry to set up this stereochemical relationship in an enantioselective way. So we should also think about how that building block was prepared. If you follow the citations in the paper this can be traced back to work done by Paul Grieco in 1986. And in the reaction he describes this small simple molecule here, allyl trimethylsilane, is reacted with a substituted amine, for, for example benzylamine and formaldehyde in aqueous solution. And the first step that I haven't drawn out is that the amine condenses with formaldehyde to form this iminium, a manich type intermediate. And then because of the cation stabilizing effect of silicon, this double bond is nucleophilic enough to attack the iminium like so affording a, a beta silyl stabilized carbocation product and then of course some molecule of solvent comes along picks off the silicon and regenerates our double bond uh, but the reaction doesn't stop here because this amine is now free to react with a second molecule of formaldehyde so once again the aluminium ion is formed and now you get a an azer prins reaction this is presumably favorable because it's intramolecular and so the double bond attacks the highly electrophilic iminium ion and then forms the secondary carbocation which is quenched out by reaction with the hydroxylic solvent to afford this 4-hydroxy piperidine uh, in 81% yield uh, in all in one part from these very small and simple starting materials. Grieco's work was further elaborated on by Hayes and co-workers and they're now using glyoxylic acid as the aldehyde partner. So like we saw previously, the aluminium ion is formed, get the azoprins, get the cyclization, and then we trap out the 4-hydroxypiperidine. Uh, but now we have two substituents on the piperidine ring and the stereochemical disposition obviously matters because these could turn out to be cis or trans. Uh, it happens that all of these steps are actually reversible, so you get an equilibrating mixture of the cis and trans disubstituted piperidines. And the trans case is the most interesting because whilst most of the time it'll sit in this more energetically favorable diequatorial conformation, when a, a small amount of that equilibrium exists as the diaxial conformation, this hydroxy group is now close enough to the carboxylate that it can close shut and form this lactone product. And that has the effect of freezing out the stereochemistry because this obviously can't interconvert anymore. It's no longer reversible. So the end step of this reaction, you still get a racemate because it's uh, non enantioselective but you get a complete diastereoselectivity for the hydroxy group and the carboxylate group to be on the same face of the piperidine ring. And this step was made even better by workers at Böhringer Ingelheim, who found that by appropriate choice of a chiral substituent on the piperidine nitrogen, they were able to cause this reaction to go with a modest degree of enantioselectivity, although to fully purify the building blocks in enantiopure form, it was necessary to carry out a resolution by crystallizing the lactones with the appropriate choice of a chiral acid, in this case a camphor-derived sulfonic acid. 
but after the crystallization the enantiopure building blocks can be obtained and then it's just a couple of steps to get to the building block we saw in the Pfizer paper. So uh, methanolysis with hydrogen chloride uh, converts the lactone into the methyl ester in the free hydroxy group and reductive removal of the alpha methyl benzyl group with palladium on carbon and hydrogen affords the uh, piperidine building block. But then in 2014, they came out with a, a slightly improved route, and this used an enzyme as the source of the chirality of the product. So this route looks quite a bit different. Starting with the tozol protected benzimidazole, they lithiated it with LDA at minus 15 degrees to afford this aryl lithium. And then they reacted it with the triflate salt of an N-methyl pyridinium cation, and that's sufficiently electrophilic enough that the aryl lithium directly adds in at the two position and breaks the aromaticity of the pyridine ring. Uh, the product is this enol ether, and by simply treating the enol ether with acid, they are able to decompose that to the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. So you can see they're going from an aromatic building block to afford eventually a fully saturated core. So that's an interesting and different way of doing it. The next step is the reduction of this undesired extra double bond. This took a fair amount of optimization because they were finding that a lot of the reagents over-reduced the ketone to the hydroxy group as well. Eventually the reagent of choice turned out to be some kind of copper hydride species, which was generated in situ by the combination of copper bromide and lithium triterbutoxy aluminium hydride. So this enabled them to reduce the alpha-beta unsaturation while maintaining the ketone. And then after that the tosyl group was removed by treatment with hydrochloric acid to deprotect the benzimidazole part. And for the next step, uh, it's important to note that whilst we have set up a stereocenter in this substrate, it is actually able to racemize. So perhaps due to some stabilization by the benzimidazole, the nitrogen is actually able to break this uh, neighboring bond and form this ring-opened intermediate. And of course, when that closes, there's no bias on whether the benzimidazole ends up up or down. So the stereocenter at this position is actually able to scramble. The racemization actually turns out to be a good thing because this is the step that the chirality is introduced. Uh, so the substrate was reacted with this enzyme, ATA036, in the presence of the cofactor pyridoxal phosphate and isopropyl amine. And this enzyme is a transaminase, so what it means is it's uh, swapping out the amino group from the isopropyl amine with the ketone of our substrate. And it affords uh, a 10 to 1 mixture of the trans to cis substituted piperidine rings. And because it's an enzyme, it's excellent um, in antioselectively, so 99% in antimeric excess, and the reaction proceeds in 85% yield as well, which is pretty decent. And I mentioned the racemization. What's happening in the reaction part is we're getting, we've got the version with the benzimidazole down and the version with the benzimidazole up. And the enzyme is only interested in reacting with one of those enantiomers because it itself is a chiral environment. And so when it reacts with the version with the benzimidazole down, that's removed from the equilibrium. And so just by the basis of Le Chatelier's principle, um, the wrong enantiomer will then carry on equilibrating to the correct enantiomer. And eventually all of the racemizing starting material will be converted to the desired chirality in the product. So this is a form of dynamic kinetic resolution. And having obtained this building block with high enantio and diostereo selectivity, that's the hardest part of the synthesis done. All that remains is to add the urea fragment. And for various reasons involving safety and stability at scale up, they chose not to use the 4 cyanophenyl isocyanate, but instead they started with the 4 cyanoaniline, reacted that with 1.1 equivalents of carbonyl diamidazole to form this uh, intermediate adduct here. And that's competent as an isolating agent. And so the reaction of that with the amine is the final step in this improved synthesis of Glastogib.